option because then every time I clicked on the link, it would make a half of second long recording and then send me an email pinging me, telling me my recording was done processing. So I turned off the auto record. Um, so if you notice me forgetting to hit record, please let me know. Um, all right, so if we're looking at aluminum with four hydrogens around it, aluminum, if you look where it is on the periodic table, it's row three, but it's, and it's three spots over. So it has three electrons. Each hydrogen brings one electron, right? So Al H4 has a total of eight electrons not the seven that we would count up if we were doing this. Um, and I'll just do the rest of these on the board so I don't have to keep switching back and forth. Um, it has eight electrons the way it's drawn, right? Each of those bonds is two electrons, which means that we must, we must have something going on here beyond just what's drawn. There has to be a charge here somewhere, right? And so the aluminum, on the periodic table, it has three electrons. To fill its valence, it would probably want to lose three electrons. But instead of that, it's got eight electrons around it. So the fact that if we were just looking at the raw number of electrons here, we've got eight electrons. And we should only have seven just based on counting from the periodic table, right? So. If we're, if we're adding up all the electrons, that's all actually our foolproof way of doing this. Count up all the electrons you have and compare it to how many you would have if everything was neutral. If everything was neutral, it'd be seven electrons, So and we have eight, so we have one extra electron. So this, this entire compound has to have a negative one charge. And specifically because the aluminum has extra electrons around it, it starts with three electrons on the periodic table, and now it's got a total of eight, which means it's, and if you count each of those bonds as being half as the number of electrons because it's sharing them with the hydrogen, it's really got access to four electrons around it. And you, remember, you guys remember doing this from, from doing Lewis dot structures? When you're evaluating which Lewis dot structure was more stable, we looked at formal charge, and we looked at how many does it have on the periodic table versus how many does it control? That's the, the official definition of formal charge. Um, and so in this case, it controls four electrons. And so therefore it's, and it has three on the periodic table. So the aluminum has a negative one charge. Do the hydrogens have any charge to them? No, because on the periodic table, hydrogen has one electron, right? Each of these hydrogens has a full valence, so it has two electrons around it, but it's sharing them all. So these two electrons between the aluminum and the hydrogen only count for one controlled electron. So the, each of the hydrogens has one control of one electron, and on the periodic table, it has one electron. So each of the hydrogens is neutral. All right, so let's do another one. Do you mind if I just interject real quick? Yeah, please. I don't know if this happened to anybody else, but I jumped on the lecture Zoom instead of the uh, lab Zoom. So sorry for being late. I have no worries. I, in order to have it occur twice in one day um, and then repeat the way I wanted to, I have to have two different Zoom meetings, the way the schedules worked out, or the scheduling software is designed. So it's not the easiest, but that's the only way I could get it to work. Um, oh, okay. But we'll continue to get, you know, slow starts. So make sure everybody gets used to it while we're, while we're doing this. All right. Try to get caught up with what you're talking about. Sorry. No problem. And Cody, granted, it's been a long time since I had you as a student because I was all the way back last fall. But it seems like it was just yesterday you and I were talking about formal charge because this was like the last thing we covered before Carl took over. Yeah, it's pretty fresh in my mind, too. It feels like it wasn't that long ago. Okay. 
All right, so if we have oxygen, and when, I, when we have a lone pair, especially on the whiteboard, if we have a lone pair um, that's not part of a bond, I will frequently draw it like this with the circle around it just to make it obvious because it's really easy to just miss two little dots on a whiteboard. Um, but you don't need to do that and the textbook doesn't have them always written like that. So in this case, each of the hydrogens has one bond and it has one vacancy, right? So hydrogens are all good, just like with the aluminum hydride we were just talking about. Um, everything's got a full valence, so our Lewis dot structure is, is stable that way. Oxygen, we would normally think of oxygen as having two bonds, right? It has two vacancies, so to be most stable, to fill its valence, it needs two bonds. Here, the oxygen's still got a full valence because it's got the eight electrons around it, but it's got three bonds. So instead of having two lone pairs that it has complete access and control over, it's got one lone pair that it has control over, and then it's got six shared electrons. And if, it's, if the electrons are being shared, it doesn't control them all the way, right? And so they count for half as much. So a bond counts for one electron. It counts for two electrons in terms of filling up the valence shell, but it only counts for one electron in terms of the charge of this atom. The subtle distinction, but you guys will get better at recognizing it. So if one of those bonds belongs, electrons belongs to the oxygen, for each of these bonds, the oxygen has a total number, it has control over five electrons, right? Three from the bonds plus the two that it has outright. And the, the analogy that I always use when I'm first teaching you guys this is it's like buying a pair of snowmobiles with a friend, right? Because you might want to buy two snowmobiles, but you can only afford one. So you and your friend split a pair of them. That's like these electrons, right? So you only really own one of them, but you could have both of the, if you needed both of them to go out, you could have both of them, but then your friend would want both of them, right? So on average, you have one snowmobile. So, Oxygen's got five electrons on the periodic table. It's got six valence electrons, right? Just based on counting over from the left-hand side of the periodic table. So the charge on the oxygen would be a plus one. And again, the other way of thinking about it logically is it's sharing more than it wants to, right? And so if it's sharing more than normal, it doesn't have as many electrons as normal, okay? Let's look at now I'm going to draw this one a little differently than the it's drawn on the slides just to make the point that you don't have to draw these structures in a straight line. So, and again, the fastest way to count this is if, if something has the normal bonds, the normal number of bonds that that atom will want is usually the way we think about it in OCHEM. Carbon is most stable with four bonds. Carbon with four bonds is always going to have a formal charge of zero. Right, and it goes through the same process that we did for the aluminum and the oxygen. If you count up how many it has control over it owns four electrons and it's in the fourth column on the periodic table. So it still follows that same logic, but you'll get really quick at with carbon, all you do is count bonds. And with some of the other non-metals, that's the fastest way to figure it out. Nitrogen normally makes how many bonds? How many vacancies does it spot? Does it have? Three. So if it's got, normally has three bonds and it only has two, but it still has the full valence, is that an extra electron or is it missing an electron? Extra? Extra, exactly. Yeah, because normally if it had three bonds, this pair right here would be shared with something else, right? So the fact it's not sharing means it has an extra electron. So this nitrogen um, would have a negative charge and you will sometimes even just see it written 
sometimes tech, the textbook will not even write the, the lone pairs in there. It'll just draw the, the carbons bonded to the nitrogen and just put a negative one charge on the nitrogen. That implies that those two lone pairs are there. Because in OCHEM, unless you're told otherwise, assume something has a full valence. So if the nitrogen's got a negative charge, if it's just written like this, that means that it's got two lone pairs on it. It takes a little bit of getting used to see what I mean though about we're really shifting our frame of reference compared to Gen Chem. Gen Chem was a little bit the opposite the way we thought about it. But with OCHEM, because we're gonna be a little bit more focused, this works. Um, let's do let's do one with some double bonds involved. So this is formaldehyde, as Cody noted in his in his science meme with formaldehyde and casualdehyde. Um, if we protonate it, if we make formaldehyde act as a base, you can add an extra H H plus ion by sticking it on that oxygen there. It still has one lone pair there. So do any of these atoms have a charge on them? Which one, Cody? I didn't look at the periodic table, but I think it's the oxygen. Yeah, like I said, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, are and hydrogen are the ones that you're going to have down pat. Oxygen normally makes two bonds. Just think of H2O, right? Here it's got three bonds, so you know it's got a charge. Is it a, is it a positive charge or a negative charge? Positive. Negative. Negative. Positive. So normally it would have two lone pairs, right? If it had if it had two bonds, it would have two lone pairs, right? And then we added the extra hydrogen. So it's sharing more than normal. So it has less electrons than normal. Positive. Gotcha. It makes it positive. You see why t you have to take a year of Gen Chem before this, because if you were still struggling with electrons or negative, this would go would be even more confusing, right? Totally. Now that this that's second nature, though, this now we can focus on the new weird and unusual stuff. Hey, Sean. Yes. Um, what's uh, what slide are you on? Like what number? Um, I think this is around number thirty. I made a really big slide deck for this one, and so it'll probably take us through most of of uh, Thursday's lecture too. Which is cool. I just wanted to like, kind of follow along with you. Yeah, no, please. Um, I'm just throwing them up as I go. And I'm not even going to do E right now. I guess it, we're doing well. And that one's an easy one to draw. Okay. So carbon doesn't have four bonds. Right off the bat, we know there's a charge. Question is, does it have extra electrons or is it missing electrons? Leaning towards extra. So normally, if it had a, another hydrogen here, it would be sharing this pair, right? It's not sharing them, it has complete control over them. So we've got five, control of five electrons around the carbon, which means it's got one extra electron. So this would be a negative charge. You guys remember the terms cations and anions? Vaguely. So anion stood for a negative ion, and cations were positive because the T looks like a plus sign. Yes. Or you can think about it because if you like cats, you can just think of it as because cats are a good thing, so cations are positive. <laughs> um, so we, we will further bastardize those words. And so cation, we're going to just... Anytime you've got a carbon with a positive charge on it in this class, we're going to call it a, it's called a carbocation. This is exactly what it sounds like. It's a carbon with a positive charge. And in this case, this is what's called a carbanion. Makes sense. Just, I will frequently slip up and use terms that I, in, that I haven't officially defined, but those are two of the more common ones. So carbocation, carbanion, they mean exactly what they sound like. 
but just so you've seen it before. All right, what are we doing? All right, I'm gonna go back to some slides here. And we'll do a few more slides and then we'll, um, once we get into talking about isomers and stuff like that, then I can turn you loose on the assignment. Um, which, by the way, the assignment, I'll just, I'll talk about that all at the same time. Um, when we get into, now that we're drawing different Lewis dot structures, sometimes when we get to larger molecules, especially, there's more than one way that you can draw them that meets all of our criteria for Lewis dot structures. So if you look at both of these, again, the lone pairs aren't necessarily drawn, but you can see both oxygens have two bonds. So we would assume that they're neutral and that they have two lone pairs that are implied. Um, and let me get the laser pointer. Um, but both of these meet all of our criteria. Everything's got a full valence. We use the right number of electrons. Um, everything's got a, the right number of bonds. So how do we decide which of these we're talking about? And this is where really where the reason why we have a whole separate set of, of nomenclature rules for OCHEM is because we need to be able to describe not just what the formula is, because that's all we cared about in, in Gen Chem, right? It was how many carbons do you have? How many oxygens do you have? Carbon dioxide versus carbon monoxide. Um, in this case, we need to know more than just what we have, what atoms we have. We need to know how they're connected. Because you can have different, what are called constitutional isomers. A constitutional isomer means it's got the same formula, but with the atoms arranged in a different way. Right? So in this case, dimethyl ether and ethanol, two very, very different compounds. Um, but they're both C2H6O, right? So the fact that they share the same formula makes them constitutional isomers. Um, and if you look at some of the properties, the easiest property to look at for a lot of these is the boiling point. Boiling point of dimethyl ether is, is uh, below zero Celsius. Um, negative 23 Celsius is um, below zero Fahrenheit actually as well. Um, versus ethanol, which is drinking alcohol, which boils around 80 Celsius. It's so very different properties, very different properties physiologically too. Um, drinking alcohol versus this, this ether is not what they would use as an anesthetic um, or the one from Fear and Loathing. Um, it evaporates too quickly. Um, so they would, it would be diethyl ether, would be two carbons on either side of the oxygen, would be the one that's traditionally used as an anesthetic. Um, but anyway, it shows that we can have very different properties because this would also mess with your head in a very similar way and put you to sleep as, as diethyl ether. Um, and so one of the, one of the ways that you can ask, I can ask you really good questions that show me that you understand how to draw these structures, um, is to do questions like this to say, draw all constitutional isomers with these formulas. So we're not going to do all of these here. And this is, I believe this one in the textbook um, has a, um, the solution worked out for several of these in, in chapter one. Um, and when they say draw all constitutional isomers, they mean all the constitutional isomers where you're going to have a formal charge of zero or as close to zero as possible on all the atoms. So, you know, if we look at the, the formula for the last C, C2H6O, we could have put O with four bonds and then a carbon with four bonds and then a carbon with only two bonds, which, oh, sorry. So if you this still meets all of our criteria for Lewis dot structures, right? Because everything's got a full valence and we use the right number of electrons. But the difference is, is that this one, the oxygen's got four bonds and the carbon has only two, right? Which means the oxygen's gonna have a formal charge and the carbon's gonna have a formal charge. This would not be considered a constitutional isomer, even though it has the same formula, 
because this isn't nearly as stable. This will actually spontaneously rearrange into ethanol. It'll move some of these hydrogens over to the carbons um, in order to make it more stable so that the carbons all have four bonds and the oxygen has two. So when I say draw all constitutional isomers, that doesn't mean every possible combination. It means all of the combinations where the formal charge is close to zero um, or is yes. as close to zero as possible. So if we wanted to, again, I'll leave this like, like this for now and work through one of these. Um, but it becomes just a, a matter of, you know, counting how many bonds you have. If there's no charge, then every carbon's got to have four bonds. And then it's just a matter of how many ways can I arrange what's left around the carbon. So if we have C, C3, try to write it where the glare is not going to get in the way, C3, seven, CL, how many bonds is each hydrogen going to have? Just one, right? And how many bonds is the chlorine going to have? Also just one. Only one vacant spot on the chlorine, right? So under normal circumstances, chlorine's only going to have two, uh, one bond as well, which means none of these can be in the middle, right? They can't be central atoms because you can't have, how can you have a central atom that only has one bond to it? By definition, it has to be at the end if it only has one bond. Right, so we know our carbons have to be in the middle. And then we have eight other things to, re to arrange around the carbons. And we need to do it in a way that, so that each carbon has four bonds. The other way I joke about these type of questions is these type of questions are testing if you can count to four. If you're just counting to four, don't go to five. Five is right out. If you draw, that's the cardinal rule. The cardinal sin in, in organic chemistry is drawing a carbon with five bonds. There's no faster way to make me lose faith in humanity than to, for you guys to turn something in with a carbon with five bonds. So in this case, you can just start by drawing all your bonds and then just say, okay, how many different ways can we arrange the eight pieces that are left? We could put, we'd use all of our hydrogens and just go left to right. And once we get to the end, we've run out of hydrogens, right? That's seven. And we have one spot left and we have the chlorine left, right? So we could put the chlorine at the end. What, what other way could we arrange these? It would be a different compound. Having the chlorine and on the center carbon. We could put the chlorine in the middle instead of on the end, because if the chlorine is attached to the second carbon, that's not going to be the same compound, right? Because in the way you can tell if it's the same compound or not is if you have to break a bond and reform a bond to get to redraw it that way then it can't be the same compound. This chlorine is attached to carbon two. If we go count carbons as one, two, three. Having chlorine attached to carbon two, to get it attached to either of the other carbons, we would have to break that bond and then reattach it. So we had, let's see, I'll leave that there and I'll use a different color. We can put the chlorine here. We can put the chlorine here. Are there, on it, uh, like on the first carbon? You can put the chlorine at the first carbon. Is that going to be a different compound? Or is that really, is that going to be the first one just flipped here? I'll, I'll draw it, redraw it here. So if we draw it the other way, draw the bonds for the hydrogens but not fill them in right now in the interest of time. If we if we took this molecule, remember these molecules are a three-dimensional object, right? So if we took this 
and just flipped it over like a pancake, we'd get this bottom one, right? So both of these are the same compounds. They're the same because all you have to do is draw it differently. It's, you can think of it as, as you've got three carbons in a row and you've got chlorine attached to the end. Doesn't matter which end, because just like a, tying a piece of rope around something, it doesn't matter which end of the piece of rope you tie to it, it's gonna look the same, right? So in this case, these are the same. What about that? If I put the chlorine at the, if I just draw it facing a different way. This is really getting in some review that we haven't really done too much before um, in a while. So these carbons that have four electron groups around them, they're all three dimensional, right? They're tetrahedral, you guys remember that term? Which means that this, they're not really 90 degrees from each other. Really, these are about 109 degrees from each other, right? And they really, you're going to have one. You have, if you have two bonds that are in the plane of the board that are flat, you're then going to have one that sticks out towards you and one that goes away. So I'm going to fill in all the hydrogens for this one. And then let's say that's the chlorine that we had drawn. Well, if it's not really three-dimensional, it's really got this sort of three-pronged fork shape going over there. Drawing it as the chlorine going straight off the end versus the chlorine going to the bottom, that's just like taking this and twisting it, right? So it doesn't matter which, if, it's, if we're talking about all carbons that have four single bonds, all of these things are free to rotate. And so it doesn't really matter if you draw it pointed down or over here or up here. That's the same bonds. All you have to do is twist this thing to get the chlorine to face whichever way you want. All three of these positions spatially are pretty much identical. They're all the same angle from this main carbon group. So this wouldn't be a different isomer either. Do you mind if I confuse things a little bit? If you had a, a double bond on that second to third carbon, it would matter though, right? So if you have a double bond, I just broke the cardinal rule though, right? I added five bonds to a carbon. So we would have to get rid of one of those. In that case, and we're gonna, this actually is not that off topic because one of the next few things we're gonna talk about is, is double bonds. Double bonds can't twist freely. The shape of these double bonds, remember that we call them pi bonds. There were those ones that looked like, depending on who you had as a teacher, they either looked like um, a canoe shape above and below the single bond, or I've heard them described as vampire teeth, sort of like claws. They, they don't really, they don't stay in between these two carbons. They kind of exist above and below. Usually we draw them either with two different colors or draw one of them light and one of them dark. But that means that you can't freely rotate if there's a double bond. So in that case, it would matter which way we drew it. But we'll get more practice with that once we get, we'll get practice with single bonds first and then add in double bonds. Just excited, sorry. No problem, good question. Um, would it matter whether we drew for the isomer where we had chlorine drawn here? Would it matter if we drew it above or below? No, same logic. All these things can freely rotate around. So we could draw it up here. Like we could even draw the other carbon down at the bottom here if we wanted to. Right? but the connectivity doesn't change between those. You don't have to break any bonds. You just have to take the bonds that are already there and twist them to get back and forth between those. To get from, to make this look like that, if you take it and just sort of tweak it, twist it along this bond, you're gonna rotate things around and make it look like it's that other shape, right? So what we're really looking for is what what carbon is something attached to in the chain 
not and we're in the context of is it the end of the chain or the middle of the chain not is it facing up or down or is it attached to the left side or the right side let's do let's do c4h10 So C4H10, again, all the H's, we're just gonna fill in after the fact, right? So all of our carbons are gonna be the what are in the middle and then we're gonna surround it with the H's. The easiest way to do this, the simplest molecule you could make like this would just be to put four carbons in a row, right? And then if you add in enough bonds, so that every carbon has four bonds. If you count all those up, it's three, three, five, seven, ten. Matches our formula, right? So we're just taking this and we're just going to add hydrogens till everything has four bonds. So that would be one constitutional isomer of C4H10. Is there another way we could arrange this? One of the carbons on one of the middle carbons, or one of the outer carbons put onto one of the middle. Okay. So if we took this, let's say we take this carbon away and we replace it with a hydrogen and then we take away that hydrogen, we put the same CH3 there. So that's, is that a different molecule? I was actually thinking one over on carbon, uh, as we're looking like over at carbon three. So we, if we put it there, maybe if we do it, if we do it here, that's still four carbons in a row, right? I just drew it bent, but it's still four carbons in a row in one continuous chain. So this is the same molecule that we just drew. But, and I knew what you meant, Hava. I was just intentionally doing that to make a point. If we put it over one spot instead, now we don't have four carbons in a row anywhere. We have three carbons in a row or one, two, three, or one, two, three, or one, two, three, but no matter how you count it, you can't get four carbons in a row. So this is a different isomer than having all four carbons attached in one carbon chain. Okay. And so that's, that's going to be the most common thing that you guys run into when you're drawing these isomers is you're going to draw the same molecule twice especially if I don't tell you how many isomers there are and you're just trying and I say draw all of the isomers, the way you're going to think naturally, especially on a test situation is going to be keep finding as many isomers as I can. But you have to edit yourself and think, okay, wait, did I just draw the same molecule again? So in this case, there, there are also only two because if I did the same thing, if I, if I move this carbon and put it over there, we have four carbons in a row again, right? Just like when I put it over here. Or if I took this carbon and I tried to move it over and I put this carbon up here and switch it with the hydrogen, that's really the same molecule, just twist it a little bit, right? So the number of ways you could arrange four carbons, you can have four in a row or you can have three with one hanging off the middle. You see what I, I mean though? If I took this carbon and I added it to the same carbon here, right? I switched it, I put the hydrogen here and now I have three carb, a carbon with three hydrogens up there. That looks different, but that's still one, two, three carbons in a row with one hanging off the middle. And, and 
apologies if I'm not drawing things large enough. Um, when I get my new computer put together, I will be able to zoom in a lot better um, and make these a little bit easier to see. Um, in the meantime, if, it, if there's ever a figure that I draw that's not clear, um, let me know and I can blow it up or check the YouTube and because the YouTube is probably going to be a little bit higher and you can zoom in a little bit more um, in for this first week while we're getting all the things squared away. I think you just have to avoid that little glare spot in the middle. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately that's naturally where I try to start is right there. <laughs> um, so let's let's go one more level of complexity. So with three carbons, there's only one way you can arrange three carbons in a row, right? Because if you take one from the middle and put it on the middle again, you still have three carbons in a row. There are two ways you can arrange four carbons. You could have four in a row, or you can have, and I'll, I'm going to, for the sake of drawing these compactly, I'm going to use the skeletal structure real quick, which means every, the end of every line is a carbon. So for three carbons in a row, or three carbons, that's the only way you can arrange it, right? Because if you took this carbon and you attached it there, it's still three in a row. With four of them, you can have four in a row in a straight chain like that. One, two, three, four. Or you could take that one off the end and attach it to the middle. That's still four carbons, right? One, two, three, four. But that's not the same as this one. Anytime you're going to have your four carbons in a row, no matter how you arrange it, I can draw it like that. That's still four carbons in a row, right? five carbons, we start getting even more possibilities. I'm going to go back to drawing the complete structure here. You can do five in a row. And then all of the hydrogens that go all around it. And for your notes, you don't necessarily have to do all of your hydrogens. It's a good idea. And I hit that glare spot again. I know that's just another, that's just a line right there. Um, that the, the, as soon as you can convince me that you can count to four and not put too many hydrogens on a carbon, then we'll be able to move to using more um, easy to draw structures rather than this is, this is considered the, the complete structural formula shows every single bond, every carbon and every hydrogen, because you need to prove to me that you can count to four, but not to five. And once we're convinced of that, we can move away from drawing all the hydrogens out. Um, if we took one off the end and attached it to the middle, we could have a different isomer, right? Not just here, because that would be the same molecule. But if we took this carbon and we put it here, we would have four in a row with one carbon off the end, right? So we could have one, two, three, four with our fifth carbon off the middle. That would be an isomer. Is there another one that we could have? I see some heads nodding. So what if we did it again? We still have four in a row, right? Which means there's probably another degree of freedom. We could probably do the same thing again. Let's take it off the other end this time. And we could add it right there. Make sure it's clear that I'm not adding to that top one. That's now the longest chain that you could have is three in a row, right? You could count one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But no matter how you count, the longest continuous chain is only three carbons. So this is a different molecule than having four in a row with a single carbon hanging off the middle. Is there one more we could do? You could do five in a row 
we could do four in a row with one carbon off the middle. We could do three in a row with two carbons off the middle. If we cut this carbon off and put it over here, does that give us a duplicate? What's our longest continuous carbon chain? Four. Four. Still four carbons with carbon hanging off the middle. See what I, what I mean by it? it's really easy to draw the same molecule twice? And so that's why we're going to have a, um, our own naming system for organic chemistry that's based around count the longest possible carbon chain, longest continuous carbon chain, and then you describe what's attached to it. Because no matter how you arrange this or draw this, if you're counting your longest continuous carbon chain, you'll get four in a row. With one carbon added, and it's always going to be one carbon away from the end, right? If I move this carbon over here, it would still be four carbons in a row with a carbon off one carbon from the end. Right, so seeing all these different possible permutations takes practice and we'll keep working on it. We'll do some practice with this um, over the weekend and on Thursday as well. But we're going to keep going for now. Um, and I'll switch back to slides for a minute and then we'll be we'll be done here pretty quickly and move and uh, you guys can get started since I know we've been a lot of lecture to start the day or to start the quarter. Uh, so there's some other possibilities here you could look at, um, try them out yourself, see if you can find all the possibilities without drawing duplicates, um, give that a go. Um, but now we're going to talk about orbital shapes. It's one of my favorite pictures. This is Linus Pauling, one of my favorite chemists um, at Big Sur where he lived um, for most of his later life. Um, and he, wanted, he is one of only two people to have won two, different, two Nobel Prizes in two different fields. It's uh, just Linus Pauling and Marie Curie. Um, Linus Pauling won one in chemistry for his work on orbital overlap, and one he won the Nobel Peace Prize because he was very active in nuclear disarmament during the Cold War. Um, and he basically came up with the idea that these bonds are formed when you can bring these orbitals close enough together that they can overlap. Because if you can have these orbitals overlapping, then you can have electrons that are in both orbitals simultaneously. Right? And if you have electrons that are in both orbitals at the same time, that means that they can be filling the valence of a carbon and a hydrogen at the same time. And so the whole idea is that these bonds are only ever going to be formed when these orbitals can overlap. And there's going to be some sweet spot where you get the maximum potential overlap between these orbital shapes without getting the nuclei too close to each other. Because if the nuclei get too close, nuclei are all positively charged, right? So if you bring the nuclei too close together, you might get your orbitals overlapping better, but you wind up with the nuclei pushing each other away more. And so that's what you see with the shape of this graph that's just showing the energy of the system. If you start with two atoms that are totally separated, it's close to, we call it zero energy. Zero is kind of arbitrary. We'll just call it zero. And then as you bring them closer and closer together, you get more and more overlap between these orbitals until you reach some minimum energy, which is going to be the mo most stable point. Remember, low energy is more stable. And then if you get any closer than that, you get better overlap, but your nuclei get too close together. And so this, the shape of this graph is basically saying that there is some distance between these nuclei where you've, got, where you've balanced those out. You've got as much orbital overlap as possible, but your nuclei are still far enough apart. Um, and this is why different, different atoms will form different bonds, different sized bonds with each other, depending on what the charge is in the nucleus and the shape of your orbitals. Um, and so when, what that would actually look like is if you looked at the, the orbitals for oxygen and hydrogen in water. So if you, if you look at oxygen and hydrogen, oxygen's got a vacancy in its p orbital, and so you can bring a partially filled s orbital from a hydrogen up close to it to the point where they wind up overlapping. And remember these things are, these orbitals are really kind of 
weird four dimensional waves. Um, and so when you bring them close together, you can wind up with their, with them adding up called constructive interference. And so what you actually see in terms of the shape of the orbital, when you bring it up close is you actually get something that looks kind of like an S orbital and kind of like the P orbital. If you add both of these together, you get this. Um, and so that the shape of that, the fact that it's centered between the two nuclei, the oxygen nucleus is right in the middle here, hydrogen nucleus is right here. And so this, this bond is gonna be right in between them. And it's going to be symmetrical around the middle, around the radius. It doesn't matter if you're looking at this bond from one end, it's just gonna look like a circle. There's not gonna be one side that sticks out more than the other or anything like that. And so that's why we, we say things like the bonds can, can twist sigma bonds, um, can, can twist around because they have that symmetry. Um, if their phases don't match up, and this is gonna be a, a uh, concept we're gonna store for later, and I'll bring it up again later when it's relevant. It's not all that relevant immediately. Um, but if you bring these orbitals up and their colors, their phases don't match up, then instead of having constructive interference, you have destructive interference where they're canceling each other out. So this would be like a, a wave peak running into a wave trough. And when you put them together, they average out to nothing. So when you put two orbitals that don't match phase, you wind up making what's called an anti-bond, which seems like a weird thing to say that you're making. You're making the lack of something by having this happen. But it turns out mathematically, we have to represent this and they do show up. Um, when we start talking about reactions and breaking bonds, um, anti-bonds actually show up. Um, the problem with just having this idea and looking at these molecular orbitals or these atomic orbitals in vacancies is that it doesn't really accurately predict what happens. Because we just got done doing a bunch of examples where I said carbon has to make four bonds to be stable, right? To not have a charge. But how many partially filled orbitals does carbon have here? It's only got two, right? So in theory, carbon should only be able to make two bonds because this, you need a partially filled orbital in order to have, to make a covalent bond with your other atom. And so this, basically, this is the other aspect of what Linus Pauling theorized is that there's gotta be, we know carbon makes four bonds, but the molecular orbital, the atomic orbitals don't match up. They must change when you start making bonds. And if you remember, we, the original definition I gave you guys with orbitals is they're just a, they're a 3D mathematical function. It's a weird probability density, but it's a 3D function, which means it can just be represented with, with math, right? Just like any 3D function or any 2D function really, right? A parabola is just a function. So, and, but you can add functions to, together right? And then you get a whole new function once you add them together. Once you add, if you add all of these orbitals together, you don't get an S orbital and a P orbital. You get something else. Um, so we need to revise our understanding of what's going on here. Buzz Lightyear can help us. Years of academy training wasted. Um, this is gonna be a consistent theme in chemistry. If you keep taking more chemistry classes, we're just gonna keep getting rid of assumptions and telling you what you learned before was wrong and that now you need to learn it in the more complicated way. So this is a, a good example of that. Um, we don't actually have, once we have molecules forming, we don't actually have S orbitals and P orbitals, we have hybridized orbitals. Um, and so these hybridized orbitals are basically, they're the result of the fact that all you can do, all you need to do is take these three P functions and this S function, and you can add them all together. And then your three P functions wind up being lower in energy. Your S orbital gets a little bit higher in energy, but you can average them all out to make four orbitals that are all the same energy. And when you have four orbitals that are all the same energy, remember Hund's rule was the one that said, if you have energies that are degenerate, that are the same energy, you fill them all up evenly one after another after another. And now we've got four partially filled orbitals, which means carbon can make four bonds because it has 
it doesn't actually have, when you start making bonds, you don't actually have atomic orbitals anymore. You have hybridized orbitals. Um, and so this is, this is going to be a, one way that we, we talk about um, the different carbons is we'll talk about the hybridization of the carbon as a way to distinguish in these larger molecules which carbon we're talking about. Or, well, that carbon's sp3, that carbon's sp2, and it's referring to how many sigma bonds, how many single bonds does it have? The sigma, um, it stands for something that's not single, but you can think of it as meaning single. Um, the sigma means that it's making that regular bond shape where it's symmetrical all the way around, where it can twist and rotate freely, because there's nothing about this bond over here that's different than on that side. And so the number of single bonds something has is going to determine how many of these orbitals had to get mixed together. Um, so we want, to find, we want to find a way that we can predict this. Um, anything that's not as hybridized. If you have a double bond forming, remember I already mentioned a little bit, those double bonds form pi bonds, means that they're above and below. They're not in the same spot right in between those two nuclei. And so those double bonds actually have a different shape. They look like when you have a double bond between any two nuclei, it looks like a p orbital from each of those nuclei, from each of those atoms, that's not hybridized. So if you have a double bond or a triple bond or anything more than a single bond, then instead of having all four of these able to be mixed together to make nice stable orbitals, you only get three of them mixed together. So instead of having an sp3, and I guess I didn't define sp3, sp3 written like this, sp3 means one part s and three parts p. You took three p orbitals, three p orbitals and one s orbital and you averaged them all out together to get four of these sp3 orbitals. So this is describing how many, it's almost like a drink recipe. How much of everything did you mix together? One part s to three parts p. But if you have a double bond, you don't have all of those p orbitals aren't available. If you have a, a pi bond, one of those orbitals has to stay as a p orbital. And so now instead of having three p orbitals we can mix together, we only have two of them that can mix together. So instead of being sp3, we get a carbon or an atom that we would say the hybridization is sp2, because only two of the p orbitals were able to mix in. Does that mean that it would have uh, three bonds? Not necessarily. So let's, let's talk about what that looks like. We'll go back to, so if we have, I'm going to draw the same um, structure that's on there. If we had two carbons with a single bond between them, that's your sigma bond between the two of them. Um, and I'm going to draw this. I know we haven't gone back over molecular geometries yet, but we'll review that here next. Um, and then I promise we're going to be done at some point today. Um, so we made a sigma bond between these. We have a sigma bond, a single bond between the carbon and the hydrogens, the carbon and the hydrogen, the carbon and that carbon. So, thank you. So that's three bonds that are hybridized and mixed together. So that's but then the other part is that that, P, that pi bond is above and below. That's the part that's not hybridized. So we, only, we still have four bonds around that carbon, but we only have three electron groups. Remember using that term when we did geometries? We only have three different areas around this carbon that are taking up space because this pi bond here winds up being in this pointed in the same direction as this other sigma bond that already exists. Right, so it affects the geometry. It doesn't affect the number of bonds. Carbon to be stable still wants to make four bonds, but if one of them is a pi bond, it changes the shape. You don't get a tetrahedral carbon anymore. Ah, uh, I see. 
So that's where we were going with this. So that was the, the next step with this is if, sorry, I forgot I didn't uh, undo the, um, fix the screen so you can see the whiteboard better. Um, but so I, we can do that if you need me to um, in a second. But looking at the, the ge molecular geometries, remember these were all based on how many electron groups you had. So your molecular geometry is going to be based on the hybridization of the carbons. Carbons always have four bonds, but they don't always have four electron groups. Sometimes they have, if they're hybridized, if they're not sp3, then they might be shaped in a trigonal planar shape. Right, and so let me, I'll go back a second just to make, oh, we can do that practice problem in a second. But this is why we talk about the hybridization, why we go back to that. And one of the reasons why I don't always focus a lot on the names of these molecular geometries is because if you know what the shape is and you can talk about the hybridization, hybridization is really almost identical. It's, it's thinking about the same idea from a different point of view as just talking about what the shape is, the electron geometry of a molecule is the same as talking about the hybridization of the molecule. Anything that's tetrahedral that has four electron groups is going to be sp3. Anything that's trigonal planar that has three electron groups is going to be sp2. And if we had a carbon like these carbons here at the top, am I still, I'm not so, yeah, I am still sharing the screen. Um, so all we need to do in order to figure out the hybridization is just look at the structure and count how many bonds, how many different electron groups it has. And that tells us the hybridization, right? So this carbon has four different atoms taking up space around it, right? It has four different atoms taking up space around it. It needs four clouds of electrons around it, which means it's got to be SP3. SP3. It needs all three of those p orbitals mixed in to get to a total of four electron groups. Gotcha. So all the ones, and I'll let me erase this real quick. Um, I'll try and color code it. So that carbon's SP3. Any other carbons SP3? The carbon yeah. to its right. That this carbon right next to it. I can't draw while I'm zoomed in, so I'll I'll color these in when we when I zoom out here in a second. Any others? There's, I think there's one more. Oops. Ah. Carbon, carbon, five. carbon five. Yeah, this carbon way up here. And that one. Those are all going to be sp3. They all. And th that means they're all going to be tetrahedral, right? Because the reason that we care about this a lot in OCHEM is because the shape affects how reactive it is. The type of bond, whether it's a pi bond or a sigma bond, affects how reactive it is. It affects how much it can twist around. Um, so we're going to keep coming back to these concepts. It's going to become second nature. SP3, SP2 are going to be really inter um, you know, interchangeable with tetrahedral and trigonal planar pretty soon. Um, any, where do you guys see any sp2s? So s and then two p's would be three electron groups, right? I think it'd be any of the carbons with a double bond, right? So it'd be, those two carbons are gonna be sp2. Yeah, between three and four. How many electron groups do those have? Two. Only two electron groups, right? means we only need two hybridized orbitals. If you have a triple bond, that's really one sigma bond that's hybridized and two pi bonds that are both unhybridized, right? Because that means you need two p orbitals that are not mixed in, that are just a regular p shape. So a triple bond means that we can only mix in the s orbital and one of the three p orbitals, right? So, so the hybridization on those would just be SP, exactly. Right, so and it's a, if you have things that are bigger, that are not tetrahedral, that are 
trigonal bipyramidal or octahedral, you can get hybridization that goes higher that mixes in some D orbitals. Octahedral would be having six electron groups around a center atom, and that would be S, P3, and then you need two more orbitals. So it'd be S, P3, D2 gets you to six electron groups. But it just follows the same rules as doing electron configurations. You just add as many pieces as you need to get to the right number of electron groups. Um, and we only care about carbon in this class anyway, so we're not even going to deal with that because carbon doesn't have d orbitals. So do the organic chemists, d orbitals don't exist. <laughs> All right, and then I already touched on it. Last thing before I turn you loose is just um, remembering that these electron groups are what are going to determine the shapes of the molecules. And I think that you guys, you guys all seem to be following when I was switching back and forth talking about tetrahedral and trigonal planar pretty well. Um, so we won't spend a ton of time on it, but basically we're just looking for how many electron groups there are. I lost my pointer there. Um, and the number of electron groups we have dictates which of these electron geometries we have. And we could add in another category that said hybridization because the hybridization for anything that's linear is going to be sp. The hybridization for anything trigonal planar is sp2. Anything tetrahedral is sp3. sp3d or sp3d2. It starts getting more complicated but follows that same system for naming that. And that's going to dictate what shapes we have. And so when we're talking about central, central atoms as well, now that we start getting to bigger molecules, we can have more than one central atom. So molecular geometry is a little bit of a misnomer because we're really talking about the molecular ge geometry of one atom in this larger molecule. So we could talk about the tetrahedral carbons in this molecule or the sp2 carbons in this molecule and use that as a way to describe what their shape is as well. That's the main reason for this. And that's the reason I wanted to get to this before the assignment, um, which is posted on Canvas. Um, this assignment is basically just going to be practice drawing structures on a computer. Um, and you guys could get through this very quickly. I'm sure I've done this, this lab with some intro to chem students before, and they went through it very quickly, and their structures all looked like crap. Um, you guys are in a 200 level class and have some experience with what these should look like a little bit at least. So I have some higher expectations for you. Um, your, your job is just going to be to go through these molecules and then the, the best for, um, program I found that's freely available for everybody, it's pretty universal, is moleview.org, which if you've had a class with me, I always talk about moleview, um, is the best way to practice drawing these. Um, can you go through how to use that interface? Because I was trying to use it and it it wasn't really um it wasn't really like super obvious to me. Yeah, so it always pops up with caffeine when you load it. That's just their their filler when you when you load it up because chemists like caffeine. Um so trash can clears everything. Adding if you want to do a um, the, the easiest way to do it would be to, if you click this button at the top, it says carbon hydrogen. That means that you're going to be showing all the bonds, not just the carbons. If you leave it as the default, then you're drawing just the carbons in that skeletal structure that I mentioned, which means that you've got a carbon at each end of this line. And then, so you can keep going, oops, um, and you keep adding carbons like that. That would be our carbon, there are four carbons in a row that we were talking about earlier. Um, and then you can add off to the side, that'd be four carbons in, the, in a row with a additional carbon off to the side. Um, if you wanna see it the way we're used to thinking about it right now, hit that CH button and that's gonna show you everything. And then instead of using the, the buttons over on the left, um, you can go over on the right hand side and click on the right hand side, those are all the symbols, element symbols. So pick carbon, add a carbon, click on it, click and drag, add another carbon, click and drag again. And again, that's, there's our four carbons in a row. And if I wanted to add one off the middle, I could do that. 
then I just need to go back and then I can click over here and add hydrogens and do the same thing until every carbon has four bonds. And it doesn't like to do things at 90 degrees to each other because that's not how the real world behaves. Nothing's 90 degrees in, in three dimensional space. Um, so it's gonna try and put them off at other angles. When you're doing the complete structure like this, it won't even let me put it at 90 degrees. Um, and that's because that carbon is sp3, right? So it's going to be tetrahedral. And it doesn't want to put tetrahedral bonds 90 degrees from each other. Um, plus, then you wind up with that happening if you put them all 90 degrees from each other, where they all get too close together, and they wind up fusing. So you might have to do to mess around with that a little bit. Um, the other way you can do that is if you want to move just one atom, go up to the top and click this, the arrow here. And then you can click and drag to just move it. And then you can go back and add your last hydrogen. Right? And if you do it, once we get used to doing it in skeletal structure, it's really straightforward because all these hydrogens aren't there. And it would just look something like that, which is still not easy to tell what's going on. Um, and so it has this really nice feature that's going to make it really easy for you guys to make your stuff look good. Um, this broom here um, is if you hover over at the mouse tip, it gives you is clean the structure. Clean the structure means make it look good. So when you hit that, it rearranges everything. If you add the hydrogens back in and it looks complicated, you can hit clean again and it'll rearrange everything so that everything's nice and, and well proportioned away from each other. And then once you have it drawn here, you can either, um, the, the best way to do it if you want a good nice um, high resolution so it's not going to get pixelated if you blow it up is when you go to tools you can uh, you can hit export image and you can export it as as an image as a vector image so you can blow it up as big as you want and it won't get pixelated the easier way would just be to use a snipping tool take a screenshot um, if you're on on windows all you have to do is hit the windows key and type snip and either snipping tool or snip and sketch will show up. And then that just allows you to, you can then select part of your screen and it copies it to your clipboard and you can just copy and paste it into a Word document. Um, so that's gonna be the, the basis for at least the first part of the lab is going to be playing around with this interface until you can get the hang of using it and I lost my, there it is. Um, and so for the first part, you're gonna, it's going to have you look up the molecules first. You guys don't know all the rules for naming things yet, so I'm not just going to give you the names. Look them up on Wikipedia, see what the structure looks like, and then draw it yourself. Um, if you look it up in Wikipedia, you can just, you, in theory, could just copy the Wikipedia. Um, but that would be defeating the purpose of you guys practicing drawing these structures here. Um, and we will do lots of things. It's really easy to come up with compounds that have never been synthesized in a lab before. If you're teaching organic chemistry, when I start making, you know, random problems for you guys to practice on, I frequently will make things that have never been made in a lab. Um, and so you can't just go and look up the Wikipedia because there is no Wikipedia for something that nobody's made in a lab before. So knowing how to draw them yourself is, is helpful in that regard. Um, although you can also, and once you get them drawn, um, if you want to see what it looks like in 3D, all you have to do is hit this 2D to 3D button. So uh, the first thing I did is if I'm drawing structures to show you guys stuff, the first thing I will usually do is get rid of the 3D window because I'm going to mostly draw things in 2D. But if you want to see it in 3D, leave it like that. And then when you clear everything out, draw your structure, um, you know, the same way that we were just doing, show the hydrogens, clean it up, however you want to do it. Then when you hit 2D to 3D, it'll actually show you the 3D structure. And then you can zoom in or out, click and drag to rotate it around, see what it looks like. Um, and as you can see in this case, every one of these carbons has four electron groups. They're all tetrahedral because they're all sp3. And that's what we see in the 3D structure as well. If we got rid of a couple of these, if you want to get rid of an atom, go to the eraser. Don't, you don't have to clear the whole thing. Go to the eraser, 
get rid of a couple of hydrogens. Now we have carbons that don't have a full valence. So you can either add another carbon or you could add a double bond there. And now when I hit clean up, it'll space things out a little bit more evenly. And when we do that, we get the two carbons that are sp3 are both still tetrahedral. The carbons that have the pi bonds that have the, the double bond are only sp hybridized. So they're going to be that trigonal planar shape. Right, so this is this lab is about drawing the structures, seeing what they look like in 3D, practicing looking stuff up. Um, another really easy tip once you get the hang of this is a lot of biological molecules are actually already in Moldview's database. You just have to type the name of them. Um, so, you know, for instance, dopamine, and it comes up with a whole bunch of different options, and click on it and it loads it for you. And then you've got both the 2D and the 3D. It shows everything we've got here. And we could do the same thing here. We could go through all of these different atoms, figure out the hybridization for all of the atoms besides hydrogen, right? So that's your main skills that we've taken away here today is figuring out formal charge and hybridization and geometry. So those are the three main takeaways from today, from your first day. I know it was a lot, a lot of lecturing. So I'll be done for now. I think you guys are good to get through this, you guys um, feel free to hang out. I'm gonna, I'll open up a couple breakout rooms. Um, and he, actually I'll open up just one breakout room. You guys can all kind of work in a group um, just so that you don't have to, it's just less awkward than having me um, hovering over you in the same room as you guys on Zoom when it comes to working on this stuff. It's like me standing over your shoulder in lab. Um, so we can do that if you guys want, actually. What's a and, breakout room? So the breakout rooms are just, it's basically, I can open up a Zoom within a Zoom, um, where and that's gonna basically so that, um, and I can make it, in, I can open up three different group Zoom or uh, rooms and have t two of you go in one room, two in another room and three in the last room. Um, so you could work in small groups a little bit easier so you don't have the whole group right there. Um, you guys can just take off and start working on your own, but if you have run into, you know, how do I do this? What did you click to get that sort of questions? You either have to come back or email me. So I'd recommend getting a fair start on this one um, before you do that. Um, or you guys can all just turn off your cameras and do it in here and then just turn your camera on when you have a question. Um, cool. Just, and why don't we just go ahead and do that for now? You can leave your cameras on if you want. Um, I'll just be hanging out here, I'm probably trying to get all everybody registered for my gen chem class that is always lots of headaches um that was you guys just last year you were you were the headaches last year <laughs> um but yeah i'll just be here answering emails ask questions if you have any questions and have at it see how it goes cool thanks